Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second week in our series of professional development workshops for the 2021 Leadership Alliance Summer Programming. My name is Dr. Medeva Gee. I am the Executive Director of the Leadership Alliance, and I'm also an Associate Professor of the Practice of Behavioral and Social Sciences at Brown University. And I will be the moderator for today's event. And it has been my honor and privilege to have served the Leadership Alliance for 15 years. I started as the Assistant Director in 2006. And I would like to ask you to indulge me in a little bit because I will be stepping down as the Executive Director to pursue global opportunities in Paris, France and starting in August. And I wanted to take a minute or so to reflect on the collective accomplishments of the Leadership Alliance. This has been an amazing journey. And as you know, no journey is ever traveled alone. So I want to thank my team, my current team with Dr. Thais Bingham Hickman, our Associate Director, Ms. Maria Deval, Conference and Events Specialist, and Samantha Anderson, our Coordinator of Undergraduate Programs and all of the family and mentors and friends and colleagues, all of the Leadership Alliance Institutional and Summer Program Coordinators, our partners, our funders, the Brown University community, and especially my family. The mission of the Leadership Alliance is to develop underrepresented students into outstanding leaders and role models in academia, the public and private sectors. And every day I work with the Leadership Alliance, I was thinking about that mission and I think we have accomplished a lot and I am really excited about what we've done. During the years we have developed new programming and in this past year, which was so difficult, we were able to turn unprecedented times into opportunity by developing this event, this virtual professional development series and virtual summer research experiences. This event is a component of the Leadership Alliance virtual uh, virtual professional development series, the conversations with the doctoral scholars. And our doctoral scholars are our alumni who participated in the summer research early identification program as undergraduates and who continued along their various pathways to pursue a PhD or MD PhD degree in a wide variety of disciplines. And I remember when I was the associate director at the time, it was in 2008, we had celebrated our first 100 PhDs. And it's amazing to now acknowledge that we have over 800 alumni who have obtained their PhD or MD PhD degrees. And so we are pleased to have our doctoral scholars join us for our events. Um, Eat for the conversations with the doctoral scholars, but paired with this event is our Wednesday evening workshop series, which does also feature doctoral scholars and other experts and friends of the Leadership Alliance that allows you to engage in a discussion of critical issues, allows you to network with each other, and as well as develop learning approaches and skills for navigating your research careers. So it has been my honor and my privilege, and I just want to take the time to let you know how much I have enjoyed serving in this capacity and that I will miss all of you, but know that the Leadership Alliance will continue to thrive. And I also invite you to stay in touch with the Leadership Alliance Network. We are an amazing family and we are still committed to your academic and professional development journey wherever you are along that career path. So as we continue the conversation this evening, I am pleased to introduce our doctoral scholar, Dr. Robert J. Patterson in the conversation with the doctoral scholar series. And if Dr. Patterson can join me. Dr. Patterson is a professor of African-American studies and served as the inaugural chair of the Department of African-American Studies at Georgetown University from 2016 to 2019. He is the author of Destructive Desires, Rhythm and Blues Culture, and the Politics of Racial Equality that was published in Rutgers University Press recently, and Exodus Politics, Civil Rights and Leadership in African American Literature and Culture by UVA Press, co-editor of The Psychic Hold of Slavery Legacies in American Expressive Culture, and editor of the Black Cultural Production After Civil Rights that was published by University of Illinois Press. Currently, he is working on a book titled Black Equity, Black Equality, Reparation, 
and Black communities. Dr. Patterson has worked with governmental agencies, school systems, and other organizations to develop solutions that increase diversity. And he's also collaborated with the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving to endow the Robert J. Patterson Scholarship Fund, which supports residents of Hartford, Connecticut, who intend to pursue an undergraduate degree in African-American studies, social justice, the arts, or the humanities. And so back by popular demand, we have Dr. Patterson, who last year kicked off the conversations with the doctoral scholar. And as you know, that was a pivotal year for all of us, not just because we were all dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that we're still, in, still dealing with, but it was just after the death of George Floyd. And we are here now, we wanted to continue this conversation and reflect on, it's a little bit over a year. I mean, it was on May 26th and it's been a little bit of a year now. So we wanted to bring you back and we wanted to thank you for coming back and for always giving back to the Leadership Alliance. But we love to hear your reflections as an accomplished scholar um, in this field. So let's let's have let's have that discussion. So so first of all, let me say thank you uh, for the opportunity to be to be here this afternoon to be a part of this conversation to the Leadership Alliance for having this series with the doctoral scholars. Um, and to all of you who are joining, have submitted questions, and hopefully we'll have time to engage some of those. And to you for an amazing decade and a half of stellar executive directorship and advocacy and accomplishments for the Leadership Alliance. You often do exciting things to reclaim your time, um, as Maxine Waters might say. And so congratulations for what's coming next. I'm excited to see what you're doing and what the Leadership Alliance does going forward as well. Where are we, you know, 13, 12 or 13 months since, since George Floyd? So in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I think it was today, there was basically an article that was published uh, and the insinuation or the um, through line was that, you know, the racial reckoning, we keep using that um, language to describe what has happened in light of the murder of George Floyd. And part of what the article made the case for was that some of the polling, and now we know that polling can be tricky because of sample size, because of the um, standard of deviation, because of all of the things that make polling tricky. Having said that, nonetheless, the poll suggested that white support for racial equity, racial quality, racial reckoning across the board, not necessarily just in policing, has waned over the past year and that there is less now, not than just that there was a year ago, but before a year ago, which is a, which is significant, um, which is significant. Having said that, I stand by this and I remain firmly rooted in the belief, and I think that there are evidence that does support this, that this conversation now that we're having about racial equity, distinct from racial equality in the sense that we're thinking about the resources that are necessary to close what I and other scholars would describe as the accumulative um, gap that has occurred since enslavement, slavery, since Jim Crow segregation, right? And then all of these post-civil rights twists and turns that have legally allowed for Black people and Black communities and Brown communities as well to be economically and otherwise disenfranchised. And part of what the equity focus suggests is that giving the same amount is not enough, but rather you, we have to think about what resources are necessary to account for this historical difference that has had long lasting impacts. And so this is a hard conversation for people to have because they do not want to have it. Right. And so this is not just about I cannot conceptually wrap my head around this concept is that I fundamentally disagree with the concept as it is, because for whatever reasons that some are understood and some are not, people are invested in ideas about meritocracy, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, equal access to opportunities, 
anyone who works hard can achieve the American dream, et cetera. And, and that just really throws into crisis equity on the one hand, and then all these other American notions about how we succeed on the other. And the idea that the government has systematically and systemically held non-white populations behind on the basis of race as it intersects with those identities is just the fact. And if we can't have an honest conversation about that, part of why I think we can't have an honest conversation about that is because other groups who are privileged don't want to recognize the privilege, right? Because privilege operates against the ideas of meritocracy, hard work, and et cetera. That's not to suggest people haven't done those things, but there are other forms of access that might have nothing to do with anything other than the body you were born into um, that, that has an impact. And so we see on the one hand, movement towards equity. So in local governments, you are seeing people talking about they want, an, they want an equity lens, they want an equity impact statement. So how does a policy that on its face seemingly is neutral, how does that disproportionately impact X, X group? And we always think about this in terms of how it disproportionately impacts a group negatively. I think it's important to have a conversation that says, how does this disproportionately advantage a group as well? Because those conversations need to happen simultaneously. So, so you, you're seeing those conversations. So the Biden administration by way of the um, FDA, which has had a long and sordid history of explicitly and implicitly discriminating against black farmers. We can go back historically. We can also go back to the immediate past administration. So they said, well, we want an equity model. What happened? The farmers go through the Eastern District of Wisconsin. They sue. The federal court has put a stay on that order. So, so what do we do then you know, about, about equity? And so part of the conversation that we're having, and then I'm going to sort of, you know, I could give a lecture for a long time, but I'm going to stop that. Part of the conversation we have to think about is when, you, when we're thinking about what our activism has to look like, what are the stakes of very publicly outward facing activism that can be litigated in a conservative court, right? So um, when I have conversations about reparations, I don't care what you call it, right? So if reparations is too hot of a topic um, in terms of the language, then we can call it something else, right? But, but how, do we, how do we get this? In the interview I did in terms of um, George, about George Floyd, I made reference to what's going on in my county. I live in Prince George's County, Maryland. And what the county executive did was she moved approximately $2 million from a police training um, budgetary item to reopen a, or to open up a mental health facility that had been a closed down nursing home. What I did not talk about in the interview is that when she was interviewed, she was asked, you know, what do you think about your defunding the police? And she did not take the bait on that language. What she said was, I am reallocating resources from the budget to do X, Y, and Z. So sometimes we can't get caught up on the language that we know is intended to derail the outcome that we're trying to achieve. And I think that that becomes, that becomes a very important point because especially as, as young scholars and buddy scholars, we're activists, we think we want people to understand this. We want people to get it for the ethical reason. We, this is the quote unquote, we think is the right thing to do. And people are not necessarily invested in those politics. And so it's important to think about that. The last thing I'll say about this though, if you do want to educate people, people is the reallocating money from policing back to social services and institutions, be it job employment, mental health, education, et cetera, is actually undoing what the, Reagan administration really solidified in the 1980s in, in the war on drugs and trying to balance a budget and et cetera, right? And that no matter who is in the government, we think about the federal level, both parties spend money. The question is, what are your values on what you're spending money? And part of what these pushes, these pushes for equity try to do is to get more of that money spent. 
And the idea how this relates like to George Floyd is that that didn't happen just, that it wasn't just happenstance, right? That criminal justice reform or reform of the criminal justice system is related to, whether you think it's, a, whether you think it's possible or not, is related to the reformation of these other institutions in society that are deeply connected to criminal justice reform. And the George Floyd conversation put publicly and nationally conversations that black and brown communities have been having for a long time. Yes, thank you so much for those introductory remarks. It's so important and it also helped me think a little differently about how we talk about these extremely important issues, how we, how we change the narrative so that we can see impact. And I wanna continue on that narrative because you asked some really important questions that I wanna delve deeper into, right? When you talked about not talking about defunding the police, but reallocating. Mm -hmm. So how do we take that to think about, and this is one of the questions that we received in advance. So I think what we're gonna do now is jump into the questions students have submitted either in the Q&A or have submitted in advance. And so what question that came in that I think is related to this, I'm going to put it as a two-part question. Um, one is what can we do to help raise awareness and activism surrounding racial justice issues by taking this into account, what you're just saying about the changing the narrative. Right. Um, but also because it is, you know, when we talk about equity and social justice, um, um, these issues, we also have to think about intersecting identities. Absolutely. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm combining a couple of questions, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on taking it one step further. Right. So as, as a, as a, um, as a starting point, part of it has to be about thinking about what is it that I'm trying to achieve and, and being very intentional and, and methodical about what is, it, what is it that I'm trying to achieve, right? Because part of what I said earlier is that one of the things I've been able to discern is when someone is trying to you know, pro be provocative or someone is trying to be interrogative. And the distinction I'm making here is who, someone who's trying to learn and someone who is trying to just be a rabble rouser, right? And reverse that. And so, 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 so thinking about, okay, I want to have this conversation about equity. In order to have a conversation about equity, we have to be, in, we have to be well-versed in our histories because it is being able to sort of, to, to articulate those histories that help make the case for, for certain forms of equity, right? So for example, and sometimes we don't have to go back far in history. Now, you all remember, you've read about or heard about the financial crisis of 2008. So I like to use this as an example. And part of what happened in there was that Bank of America, which had been countrywide, which, countrywide, which bought countrywide, was engaged in predatory lending, right? And they were disproportionately steering black and brown people into subprime loans, even when they could quote unquote afford a regular loan, it should have been in a better loan. These things ballooned, they foreclosed on the houses, et cetera. Wells Fargo does it, a lot of the banks do it. So I use this example to say this. Sometimes when you talk about equity, the, the people mar you into what I call obfuscation station. So they'll say, well, if you want to actually go back to slavery, how are we going to figure out who was enslaved? We know there's not any records. How are you going to figure out who's black? Although it's a question people seem to always be able to figure out. How are you going to figure out how you're going to do all these things? OK, great. We have the records from Countrywide. We know who they, we know who they targeted, right? What the government did was say, we're going to slap you on the wrist. People lost their houses. We're gonna give you nine hundred dollars. We give you a thousand dollars of settlement. It's done. They paid a vested. They paid a fine. What would it mean for those banks to have to give the people who they discriminated against the actual houses, right, and actually pay off the mortgage? You want to talk about equity? You, you do these things. So I say to say to be able to talk specifically in a way that you are discerning. If somebody's trying to, if somebody is actually trying to be educated, if somebody's trying to rile you up, but doing that work of figuring out what to be educated on, um, I do think that in these hot social issues that have, sorry, these hot political issues that have immediate social consequences, everyone thinks that that person has an opinion, and that that opinion is actually a fact. So if you were in your chemistry lab, they would not debate with you that CO two is carbon dioxide. I think I got that right. 
Um, yes, and H2O is water. Yes, I got my, okay, woo, I got my O's right. They will not debate that with you, right? Because they feel like that is a, that you cannot debate that. There are historical incidents, episodes, whatever the case is, that are actually more solid as H2O and uh, you know, CO2 are when it comes to debating what they are, but people think that they have, because they have an opinion on something, they have an expertise. And I think that um, gently nudging them to think more energetically and be helpful. As it relates to intersection, in, intersectional identities, I think that's always imp that's important. And sometimes intersectional identities get phrased or get framed as competing interests, right? And the interests, the interests don't have to be, they, they don't actually have to be competing. But I think that part of how um, we are stuck on trying to get equity is because we may buy into these competing narratives, right? And so that's why I really like to talk about advantages and disadvantages and how those different subject positions, you know, locate you in a certain way. So being black, but being a man, there are certain privileges I have in a patriarchal society, even though as a black man, they'd be relatively speaking less than someone who is white man, right? And I think that having that kind of nuance into the conversation is important. I also think you have to pick and choose your battles that you cannot, it is not, you will not be well if you fight every indignity that comes your way because you never have time to do the work. Yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. And that's really important. And I want to pick up on this thread of having conversations following the death of George Floyd and take it to the institutional level, right? Because after that happened, there was such a keen awareness, such a keen spotlight yes. on these issues. And so we saw departments going out, reading <laughs> books and having conversations. And this is related to another question that a student, that a student submitted. Um, so they say, you know, they rush to the bookstores to read up on literature, how to utilize power and privilege to elevate the issues of Black and other marginalized communities. Does this type of education play a significant role in dismantling systems of white supremacy, or is it simply a self-serving passive method of engagement? In a slightly less pessimistic way, how do we transform education into an active agent of change? Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, this is, I mean, it's particularly if any, if any of you who pursuing PhDs and thinking about, you know, becoming scholars, I think this is a conversation or you know, research intensive university where you're writing these books and things and articles, I think this is something to always be mindful of um, about what the reality of what that means and looks like. So it is, any, anyone who we could potentially draw into a conversation about dismantling anti-Black racism, dismantling white privilege, okay, right, and white supremacy is important. Why do I keep emphasizing that? I keep emphasizing this because people want to people talk about the the disadvantaged side, right? They talk about anti-black racism, perhaps, but they don't talk about the white privilege and white supremacy, which are intertwined with those. So I think that anyone who's sort of beginning to do this type of work and, and want to be involved in this conversation, it may be self-serving, but I'm okay with that, right? Because that might be that might be a it, that might be the initial concept, that might be the initial byproduct, and it might be a unrelated byproduct, but it might actually might, it might happen in that a lot of activities of um, altruism, there is something people get out of it, whether it's effective, whether whatever the case might be. How do we actually have to, to make it work? That I think we have to recognize that systemic change can be slow because regardless of how systems operate don't operate, there's a familiarity with them. And so you can see this if you think about a, a, a tangible day of life, how does someone participate in something that doesn't seem to be productive to that person's thriving? Because there's some, there might be some comfort in it or what have you. But part of it is having people aware of these conversations, right? So what does it mean to go in this space? I want people in a space, even if they don't have it all correct, they might get there. But I want you to go in a space thinking about how does this policy disadvantage other, my other people? I want also people in that same space who are saying, as an institution, we're professing that these are our ideals. In practice, these are not our ideals. We value diversity, no one here is not white. Right? We value diversity, no one here is not male or man. 
Um, we value diversity. Everyone here is Christian. And so to sort of have these conversations about what is diversity? What do we want to gain from diversity? Is it just symbolic? And I tell you, you know, there are people who, I tell you a lot of talks about the election last year, there are people who discount the importance of symbolic representation. We should not discount that. Now we can say, we shouldn't, over, we shouldn't overstate what it can do. We should say we might have to qualify its relationship to, to, um, to material representation, but we should not um, underestimate that because it is symbolic representation that has been directly, or the, or the lack thereof, that has been directly tied to the material disenfranchisement of underrepresented groups. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna stay on this, but I do promise all of our viewers that we will talk about career and how you got to where you are because <laughs> they, they would love to hear that. But I, I heard something that I want to dig a little deeper when you talked about dismantling systems. And we have a case study that's playing out right in front Listen. of our eyes right now with Hi. Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones, right? Absolutely. And, and so we have a question you know, about her, the 10 year process at the University of North Carolina. Right. And so you know, one of the students said that it's really discouraging to see universities claim they promote diversity. You were talking about these symbolic actions. Right. Um, and yet seem to reject any chance they get at following through. So is there anything, you know, so the question is how can, what can students do to advocate for diversity on boards and leadership positions in higher education? But if you could also talk broadly towards this case. Right, and so, so one of the, in one of the articles I sent you all, you know, there was a recruit, a professor they were trying to recruit in chemistry who basically said, in watching this, um, I'm gonna decline this opportunity to be part of your institution because it's speaking of some larger challenges that, that we'll have. So one of, the, one of the things I'll just say about the tenure process, and this might be, this could be getting to some of the professional questions later, is that in many respects, it is usually very secretive, arbitrary, and otherwise, you know, it can, be, it can be problematic because one of the fascinating things about what's happening in North Carolina at state institutions and public institutions, their processes are usually a bit more open, right? So candidates can see things like the letters that other people have to write for them to support their application. There's things that they can see that typically are not seen if you're in, say, an institution like Georgetown um, by, by, by a candidate. And part of why I say they're, they're, they, are, they are arbitrary is because the people who ultimately making these decisions are usually very outside of the person's field, right? So it's a university committee that's comprised of people from several um, you know, academic uh, in, um, units, we can say. But there is a telling point that is, that is, that is, that is, that is spot on, and that is this. It seems as though there was something untoward done in the case. And I don't know if they denied it so much as they refused to hear it and virtually denied it by refusing to hear it. We're gonna get more on that soon, I'm sure. But Hannah, the, the problem is that the scholarship that she's putting forth, the critiques that people make, I teach the 1619 Project in my, um, in my AFM 165, which is Black Life, Thought, and Culture before 1903 course. And so I do teach it there. I'm gonna teach it again this summer and this fall. The issue is she is putting forth a narrative of US history that better captures US history, that upends the white supremacist narrative that attempts to whitewash white supremacy. So you're not gonna see in the 1619 Project, which you saw in the McGraw-Hill textbook in Texas, referring to enslaved African people as indentured servants, as volunteers. You know, when she says that, you know, the revolution wasn't started in 1776, but it was started in 1619 in Jamestown, the point she's making is how the institution of slavery, right, fundamentally shapes the course upon which the United States history ultimately becomes. So people, so, so, so what you hear at Obfuscation Station is people um, saying, well, she said this factually wrong, but this was wrong, but this was whatever the case was. And the New York Times Magazine took a lot of flack for sort of responding to some of that. But the issue 
here is a clear case study of how we put our livelihoods at stake when we take up these causes that are trying to fundamentally alter epistemologies, how people learn, what they think, how they come to know. And, and, and when that is so settled, then that's, that's part of, what's, that's part of what, what we're seeing there. Yeah, and you know, it's, um, it's, it's important that you bring up the history aspect and telling the narrative um, in a way that is historically correct. Right. And that is factual. Right. The history of the US is not an easy history to read. Right. And right. a lot of us didn't grow up learning about the true history. Right. And, and now I feel as though that you, you opened up saying something like, you know, we, it's the movement started and then it waned. Right. The, after George Floyd, you see where people are now more engaged in having these conversations, even though they're difficult, but then there's always this pushback. And more recently, we saw that in an historical context of what you were just talking about, right. where the Lieutenant Colonel Barnard Kempter who was making comments at on uh, Memorial Day? Yeah, and he was crediting, you know, free black slaves. Yeah, also the history of free black slaves in um, yeah. Charleston, South Carolina, and he was muted. Yeah, he was yeah. muted because they, right. because they weren't there to talk about slavery. Well, how could you? Yeah. Now you not be right. And this is and this is just education. This is not. He, these are facts, right? These are facts. These he are facts. Don't want it, they do not want it to be heard because how dare you say that those blacks did something besides, you know, serve so and so? So, so I guess one question relates to that in terms of about American history that we grew up with. Um, so the question was, do you think the American history we learned in elementary school through high school is depicted from an objective perspective, or else? If you do think the answer is the latter. What perspective is it and what impact do you think it has to <laughs> solely gain knowledge from American history from schools? And I would add to that question of, you know, in more in more in terms of, you know, how can we how can we change that narrative? Because already here's someone who's trying to change the narrative and it seems like it's it's you know it's backfiring on her. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. First of all. That's a great question, but I don't, I, I, I don't want you to take whomever asked that of you on. I laughed, not the question, I laughed because I was trying to get myself an appropriate response for the venue. And so um, I would say that, you know, no, it's, history, is not a told, uh, history is not told objectively. And I would just more generally problematize or, or think more critically about what's objective and not. Part of why it's not told objectively is because someone is in the process of narrating it someone is in the process of deciding what events to share. You have a, um, a, a, a discipline of history that privileges an archive and you have a whole several centuries of where the black archive was overlooked or not existent. And that if you only went into what is considered standard historical archives to understand the ex black experience, you come up really empty, right? Um, because if even if things weren't written down, they might have been thought important enough to be written down or whatever it came to be. So you would use, you have to think who alternatively, what kind of archives, how do we recover these forgotten or disregarded or disregarded histories? So to the degree that they're always subjective interpretations being encountered of what to tell and what not to tell, I, I would say that. I would also go on to say, no, that most narratives of, um, of, of, of history that students particularly learn in, uh, in elementary school, middle school, even high school for that matter, they are furthering the objectives of white supremacy, be it implicitly or explicitly. Implicitly, the people who are writing these books, they have not, have not thought anything of the 1619 Project, don't know about it and don't wanna know about it because they're going on what they knew. And so they just put in the book and they're trying to make some money off some books. Conversely, people have access to this information. They're not interested in learning it because they already think, well, what, 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 what do black people have to add to the, to the, to the narrative? Um, so having said that, part of what we have to do is keep the Leadership Alliance well-funded and produce these scholars here, here. <laughs> who will continue to write these narratives, who will continue to expand it, who, when, you, when you're teaching 
You give your students assignments. They don't have to become a PhD or anything, but you give them assignments where you make them go find out. You make them go find out something that they didn't know. You make them go into primary sources from the 19th and 18th century. Heck, the 21st century. There's so much not to be known that you kind of just you're, you're pushing. You pass the surface. You're asking people, how is it that you know what you be, what you came to know, right? What do you think these deficits are attributed to or not attributed to? Because I promise you, even if you heard, of, even if in your education, you heard of Martin Luther King, uh, and some people didn't get that education, but even they talked about him, I promise you that they talked about the I have a dream speech. They talked about the content of your character, not the color of your skin. And they might have talked about his relationship with some of the civil rights acts, particularly the voting rights of 65. They talked, and that's probably, that's probably the, the, it may be the March on Washington. This might be what they talked about. What they did not talk about, I promise you, was his radical redistribution of wealth, right? His push for an affirmative action. He says that a country that has done something special against the Negro, I'm using the language of the time in his direct language, should do something special for the Negro. Now, he didn't call it affirmative action, but that is what he's talking about. So when you hear people now who have assaults on affirmative action equity using King, they're not only doing something disingenuous, but they're also doing something that might show what history taught them, which was a, which was a simplified, cleaner narrative that doesn't even begin to show the complexity of his politics. So even when you see they talk about him, they don't even talk about him in a way that really grasps that, the, 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 the crux of what he was putting forth. Well, I can say that we are so proud of what you have accomplished in your career because <laughs> you are helping us you know, write those stories, right? You are you are sharing those stories. You are reclaiming those stories, and you're bringing awareness to those stories. And and so we are so glad that the Leadership Alliance was a part of your academic and professional journey to to be able to talk to us today. So me so too. You. Yeah, Thank you. I was thinking when you talk story. I, I well, the first time I met you probably was at that 100 crowning thing because I came to it. Yes. And, and so why don't, I would love for us to take a quick turn to talk about your career and that whole process and, <laughs> you know, how you navigated right. those critical transitions that mm -hmm. enabled you to become a professor that is, that is really helping us reshape the narratives. Uh, okay, I, I, I'll give a couple of highlights. When I was an under, so when I was an undergrad, um, I tell this story is that, you know, it was free food that landed me, that helped land me where I am today because one of my friends who was a dear friend of mine who co-edited The Psychic Hold of Slavery with me, um, she was a year ahead of me at Georgetown and there was a program headed by uh, one of my colleagues now, a faculty member mentor at the time, Dr. Angela Mitchell, referred to as minority mentoring. And the goal of that program was to get, um, get students in the professoria, underrepresented groups. But, the, but that was, so the year, my, my senior year, Dr. Mitchell was in charge of that. But the year before that, um, Kim Hall was in charge of that. And my colleague, Sawika, was like, oh, she know, you know, you gotta know a way, you gotta know how to appeal to people. So the appeal was, come to this event, there's gonna be some free food. So I said, well, you, now you're talking my language. So I went to the event and I got acclimated with the Leadership Alliance and SROP as a consequence of it. And so similar programs, but they different set of school, Big Ten, blah, blah, blah. So I said, I want to find out more about this. I was unconvinced that I want to do a PhD. At the time, I actually thought I wanted to do an EDD or PhD in um, higher ed administration. My plan was to go back and be a superintendent of a large uh, public school. So I then said, though, I could actually, let me see about this academic life. So I went to Stanford for the summer, Stanford, California, where I, where I didn't realize that there were dorms that didn't have air conditioners, particularly at Stanford. And then I got there and found it out. Apparently, that was the week, the first time it had been hot in the summer. Um, and apparently, it turned it in forever. So we get there, we're burning up. But I was like, this is great. I was working on my, um, my honors thesis for my English major. And so I spent 10 weeks reading and thinking and thinking and reading and being out in the sun, just, just having a, a, a high enough time. And so I was came back and I still wasn't convinced that this was for me. But I said, let me apply both paths. And then I said, now this is silly because I was like, this is too much. I don't want to move past. So anyway, 
I applied to PhD programs. I applied to the Ford Foundation for the pre-doctoral fellowship, which I did earn. The spring came around, the last day, I'm sorry, the last day that you could apply, someone said, um, have you heard, did you apply to Emory? I never heard of Emory University because I, I was intentional on avoiding the South for my undergraduate career. Like DC was, that Mason Dixon line, we were good. So um, what I did end up going to do was I applied Emory last minute, had to overnight it. Anyway, got into Emory and some other places too, but Emory had the, they had quite a package um, in terms of finances and guaranteed funding. They had a lot, they had less teaching. Teaching is great, but it can, it may not be great if you're trying to finish a dissertation, which people who have mentored and told me. And on top of that, the senior scholars in the field with whom I wanted to work were there and one was going there. So I went there. Fast forward, when I came in, they said you have five years of funding. If you need some extra, we can parlay that for you. I don't know what you can do. I know this written contract said I had five years. I intended to be done when that was the case. While I was there, I did some more kind of mentoring. So um, one of my advisors, the late Rudolph Bird, was over the Emory Mellon. So MM, the MMUF, I think that's what it is. So that's what they have at Emory. So I was a residential advisor there in the summer. And so I was always interacting with fellow grad students who were working with the students. I didn't work with the students like that, but I was a bit present. But finished up, applied for tenure track job. My first tenure track job was at Florida State University. Now, having lived in Atlanta, Georgia and Washington DC, Tallahassee was not where it was for me, though it was there for someone. Um, I was a young professional. I couldn't go anywhere. Students were everywhere. That was not the life I was trying to have. Um, I had a, I got a fellowship the next year. I lived in Washington, DC. I was on leave a semester. I went back to Florida State for a semester and then the rest is history. I came to Georgetown as a visiting professor for a year. I went on a tenure track the following year. I ended up going for, up for tenure a year early. Um, and then I became the director of the African-American studies program, which was an interdisciplinary program. I then became the inaugural chair of the department, which, which really came out of student activism, not around Floyd, but the similar type of stuff that you see around Floyd, you saw around Michael Brown, um, you saw, you know, when the football team at Mizzou wasn't gonna play, you sort of saw universities begin to respond and, and Georgetown had its own drama. And I'll say this, I'm gonna say this last thing and then I'm gonna um, stop, but, I had been working hard to sort of institution build. And being the chair of African American Studies, we didn't have any, we had faculty, we had all the faculty, we got a major that year. I mean, the African American Studies together, this is not tooting your own, I'm just telling you what I had to do. I actually had to build this thing from the ground up and people weren't helpful in terms of other departments and documents, they just, just weren't that helpful. I was the only full-time faculty member of the department. I realized though that in the, in the spirit of slavery, the psychic hold of slavery, the afterlife of slavery, um, that work did not matter to the university in the way that my research would matter in terms of my promotion, my economic well being, my family, and me. And so I said, I'm going to pay Robert first. And I finished that second book. I was editing this other thing. And I went up for full professor while I shared. And so I am. Um, relatively young, I think, and I'm a full professor of African American studies. And, and if I leave Georgetown, stay at Georgetown, regardless, if I continue to want to do this, I will be a full professor. And I think that as underrepresented groups, if full professorism is something you desire, it may not be, and that's fine. But if that's a track you go on, that's something to desire, as soon as you become tenured, if not before, they are going to try to get you on all of these things that you are going to be personally committed to because your personal investment, which they're going to exploit, or let me not use that language, I forgot you're young, and which they're going to um, recognize that you have this love and desire. And it's really about a balance act. We get, for the black and brown people who get tenure, we get tenure, but often we don't go up for full professor. And people will attribute that to behavior, but I have already cautioned you against those behavior explanations. This is about the institution and the structure that are in place to work you so that you don't have the mental capacity and or time to make those other research marks. 
That's a great story. And, and I want to, I saw a question that came in the Q&A, and I'm just going to take the latter part of it. For your research, did you ever get pushback from, against your topic from others? <laughs> you know, if, 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 it hasn't, um, if it hasn't become apparent yet, um, you know, I can, uh, I can be assertive. And so <laughs> I, I really have, I, I, I have and I haven't. I was very intentional about who I work with. So I had all black dissertation committee, senior scholars in the field. This was important because they knew the field. They could direct me. We had conversations about, oh, I think you should write in this book. Mm, I hear you. I don't want to write in that book. And then I didn't. Now, when I did my monograph, I did include one of those books they talk about in substitution and stuff like that. But I didn't want to do it at the time. And I sort of did not. I think topically, when you're doing anything in these um, and, and knowledges, epistemologies that are underrepresented in society and in, in, in the academia, I think there's sort of a sense of what's the value added, right? So in the first book, I felt like I got to show I know how to do this thing, whatever case is. My second book was fun. I'm out in Phoenix interviewing Adina Howard, having mimosas, videotaping. I'm, I'm, conversation. I'm getting to listen to things and watch things that I want to enjoy doing anyway. And I think that that for me was very important to be able to actually do that while I was chairing that department. Um, but anti-black racism is real um, or anti-whatever, trans, anti-whatever, anti-non-normativity is real. And knowing that it's, it's just a lot of strategy, like it's not just about what you do as strategy. It's about who knows what in your, if you go to a graduate program and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm at the university of my dreams but there aren't any specialists at the university of your dreams, but you have this university of your dreams. Your dreams could be deferred because what could happen is you would do a project that does not have the insights, the contemporary scholarship to make you as competitive. And when we get, when I have read files or things that I'm like, mm -mm, there wasn't a specialist there because the specialist would have pointed them in a different direction. Because it's not about agreement or disagreement, it's about the knowledge base. Yeah, I want to pick up on this thread of racism being real, right? And I think more recently we saw that, you know, it goes beyond anti-black racism. We saw a lot of racism in the Asian, Asian American community. Yes. So I want to, I, there's a question that came up in the Q&A um, that I want to share with you and have a discussion on it. It says, within this conversation of equality, where are Asian Americans positioned? Is there any framework that will allow for Asian communities to better help the fight for equality while also acknowledging the diversity of Asian communities who can still face significant hardships? Absolutely. So let me just say something. The re, I, I, I foreground anti-Blackness in, in these conversations because that is what my academic training is in. When I teach my race and racism class, we deal with broader frameworks too, right? And so we know there was a, a lot of anti-Asian sen uh, sentiment comes out of immigration bills from the 1890s, right? Which is then exacerbated with World War II um, and Japan and et cetera. So I think that the events that unfortunately only began and by only, I don't mean, I, I mean as a modifier in terms of, um, when it started, not as diminishing it. With the shooting in Atlanta at the spa, at the massage parlor, unearth a lot of anti-Asian sentiment that has been lurking in the, has been lurking in American society and culture, but that sort of gets passed off. And it gets passed, it gets passed off because historically, um, some, some Asian communities, right? This doesn't, when I'm say doesn't recognize diversity, have been sort of thought about as being the model citizens in terms of how to assimilate, et cetera, the case is. And by virtue of that, right, uh, part of what that narrative does is sort of say, hey, here's, here's, here's some of the white supremacy you benefit. So, so now we're not white supremacists because of the Asian, you know, different Asian populations then. But in reality, we don't think it's about all the Asian populations. And this is sort of a facade. So I think there's a couple of things. Number one, White supremacy thrives by creating divisions among other non-white communities. The myth of scarcity contributes to that because if in fact, um, there's only a little bit of this go around and, 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 and the thinking is that, oh, 
well, it, because Asian communities have worked hard, they've gotten it, when in reality, that's not the full story, right? But this is sort of that narrative. Then part of what that then does is create these divisions. It creates the ability to not have allyship. And it creates what the question asks is this hierarchy among different Asian communities. So we know this case. Where is there a chance for, um, where is there a chance for some unity to be a part of this? Number one, parallel structure. Educating on the history of anti-Asian sentiment, which is why I said this goes back to the first, one of the first immigration bills. And what the immigration bill did was it, it stratified class. It basically said, if you're coming from um, certain, uh, certain communities and you are a doctor, a lawyer, or certain class professions, then you're able to come. If not, then X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and so I think that what we have to do in, in a similar way is to tell these stories, to think about where the parallels are, and to also have honest conversations about where there's disjunct. Right, so where have where has this buying into being a model community that has then functioned to disadvantage other, you know, groups? How has that played out? Yeah, that's important. And so I think we we've got nine minutes left, and we got so many questions. I want to I want to bring in I want to ask you another question because for me, before I get to like the final question, mm -hmm. so I do want to save time for the final question. I'm gonna be fasted too. So okay. <laughs> So, because when I think of um, this conversation on, you know, when we talk about racism is real, the flip side of that coin is, you know, conversation about white privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a question that came up, like, how do we have these conversations with those who don't understand or with those who need to, you know, have <laughs> need to understand their privilege. And right. so there's a question in the um, that gets at that. So I want to address that because I think it's really important. And there's this whole thing about, you know, because along with that, there's this whole thing about cancel culture, right? Yes. yes. So, and that relates to white privilege. Yes. And, and so I was wondering if you could, you know, take a couple of minutes to answer that. And then, you know, we can end this conversation here, but continue it um, right. as students reflect on these amazing thoughts um, about sort of, you know, what you've learned over the years. So, so yeah, so this actually is good. This, I, this, this goes back to, or at least it ties to the more general idea of, you know, thinking about histories and, and what have you. And so part of the part of the way I try to engage this, this conversation is when, you know, how do you think you got X, Y, and Z, right? And what I'm always straddling the line on is you don't want to offend necessarily, but you do want to be clear. And so you may have, you the narrative you hear in these cases, I worked hard, I worked hard. But what allowed you to work hard, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, um, so Socratic, I guess, method is to continue to keep asking these questions and sort of to pull back. Because the point you're ultimately trying to get at is this. Your hard work alone is not what got you there. And the things that got you there, you may be cognizant of and you may not be. And part of what I'm trying to do is bring these things to your attention, right? So, you know, you had access to these schools. Why did you have access to these schools? Well, because I had access to these schools because my parents bought a house in this neighborhood. How were your parents able to buy a house in, the, in, in this neighborhood? Well, they worked hard, they saved up their money, blah, blah. Well, where were they able to work? Okay, so let's run this first over timeline. Not only were my people not able to work there because they had discriminatory policies, the, F, the, um, the uh, FHA turned around and redlined these places so nobody would lend them money to get a house, right? Then there's these tax revenues. And, all these, and I think the point I'm really just trying to make is that in those cases, you have to say to people, you may not be responsible for the privilege that you have, you of not know, excuse me, you may not be responsible for not knowing about it, but you are now responsible for learning about it and then deciding if you want to do something about it. And if you don't want to do anything about it, that's fine. Just stop talking about the fact that you want to do something about it, right? Because you might have to relinquish some of this privilege, but it's really just kind of pointing it out that the, 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 the access privilege, when you are in these conversations, I promise you, I bet you a nickel. Well, there's a lot of you, I bet, I bet only a penny. Um, that the overwhelming majority is going to be about their behaviors. And it's so funny because when 
people are talking about why underrepresented groups are not where they are. They're blaming it for their lack of inaction or their improper inaction. And when they're talking about um, where, you know, when, when we're talking about where they are, they're talking about their action, right? But it's sort of never, so on, on either case, it's really not one to deal with these systems. Right. They certainly don't want to deal with a system where you're talking about privilege. And so my job is to help think structurally. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the first thing that comes up, to, you know, to me is the, the anniversary of the Tulsa ma massacre, yes. which, which, you know, devastated yes. um, generations of, of generational wealth. Right. Right. And I think, yeah. No, I'm saying, absolutely. Don't get me. Don't get me started. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, that's that's. All. I could just go on you know, and have a conversation just about that, but I would love. You know, this has been an amazing conversation. And before we go, I do want to ask you sort of, you know, a question, that, a, a reflective question about throughout your career. You know, what is what is the biggest lesson that you have learned that you can apply in the future, or you know, <laughs> what are some, you know, or alternatively. You know, what advice would you give your younger self? Mm, that's a good question. This is that very Jesuit tradition of George sort <laughs> of reflection. Um, you know, as I speak in songs and scriptures, one of the songs which should have been in scriptures, I wish I knew then what I know now when I was younger. Yep. And I would actually say, do what you, and I've done this in some respect, but, but it, it, and I would actually be more attentive about it do what you want to do in terms of mapping out the kind of the career you want. So if you want to do what we people are being public scholarship, there's a space for that. This career can be, depending on where you are, very um, isolating, but you don't have to be isolated, right? So you, because you, you can still be, there's different forms of community, and especially now when we think about, the, about what's virtual. And I would say, let your interests in your profession, I would imagine you have a wide range of professional interests, guide what you're doing and not do. I knew I had to leave Tallahassee because I want to leave there, I want to still be thriving. And I knew that that was not going to be thriving for my spirit. And if that actually meant I had to leave academia, I was preparing for that because it was more important to me to have a fulfilling life that included fulfilling career than to be the long suffering servant that we sometimes think of ourselves as when we're trying to change the world that, 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 that doesn't necessarily want to be changed. That's right. Well, let me just say thank you for taking on the challenge <laughs> of pursuing this career. Um, we are all the better for it. Uh, we know much more about history and sort of how to shape those narratives, thanks to what you're doing, your teaching, your scholarship, your interviews uh, on national on the national networks. It's so amazing what you're doing. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us just for this discussion. Well, well, thank you uh, for the opportunity. I had a dream about Whitney Houston last night, which is funny. I was going to close with a quote from a song. But I'm gonna tell you, the reason I'm gonna tell you about this is that in Destructive Desires, I wrote a chapter on, on Whitney Houston. Mm -hmm. And I, when people ask me, you know, is there one person you wish you could have met and doing the book or not? I was like, well, it was her, but she had, she was, had uh, passed away by the time I interviewed her. But the thing about the dream that was so funny was that um, once I met her, I, went to, I was trying to find my Destructive Desires book because I wanted to prove to her that I had written a chapter about her to which she probably could have cared less or not. Um, but anyway, the point here, going back to a la Whitney Houston, is um, one of our songs, Give Me One Moment in Time. Yes. You know, more than I thought I could be, right? Yes. You, think about, you think about these moments in time you get yes. and you yes. come with them. Yes, that, and that's so important to, to leave on. And so let me encourage the students to think about your moments in time and to continue this conversation. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. And we look forward to seeing you in future events with the Virtual Professional Development Program. Thanks everyone, have a good evening. Thank you.